On March 23rd, the Trump administration announced new discriminatory measures against transgender people by banning them from military service, which had just been granted under Obama. While this story has received widespread coverage, likely because it threatens the U.S. image as a compassionate empire, it's just the latest attack on the trans community since the right wing took power. Before Trump took office, the same forces of bigotry were waging this war. In 2016 alone, more than 50 bills were introduced in Congress targeting the lives of trans people. But now that the conservative movement occupies the highest seat of power, they're seeing their anti-LGBTQ fantasies plow through federal institutions. Trump began this assault not even two months into his administration, canceling landmark legislation in the Department of Education that protected transgender youth from discrimination at school. Then, the Department of Housing and Urban Development withdrew two policies protecting LGBTQ people who are homeless. The Justice Department has launched multiple attacks, including issuing permission to private and state entities to discriminate based on sexual or gender orientation. The Department of Health and Human Services opened a so-called Religious Freedom Division to protect hateful doctors, hospitals, and health clinics that want to refuse health care to LGBTQ patients. And this just scratches the surface. Many other major steps backward for gay and trans equality have passed, mostly hidden from public view. The emerging anti-trans policies only exacerbate long-standing legalized discrimination. For example, in 30 states, well over half the country, one can be legally fired just on the basis of having a non-conforming gender identity. Likewise, in the same number of states, one can be legally evicted from their home for nothing more than being transgender. Of course, prejudice in employment, housing, healthcare, and more is commonplace, regardless of legal backing. That's why a shocking 71% of trans people report hiding their gender identity to avoid discrimination. The impact is devastating. Trans people experience unemployment at double the rate of the general population. And that statistic jumps to four times the unemployment rate for trans people of color. In fact, 25% of the trans community reports having been fired for not following gender norms. As a result, their rate of poverty is four times that of the general population. And one in five trans people report having been homeless. The emotional and psychological toll all of this takes creates the most tragic statistic of all. According to the largest ever trans survey, 41% say they've attempted suicide. Chase Strangio, a trans rights activist and attorney for the American Civil Liberties Union, explains the impact of anti-trans discrimination. The reality is that the law, you know, doesn't ex provide explicit for protections for trans people, but even where the law is protective, we know that systems of discrimination are far beyond what the legal system um, will actually remedy. And so what we see are widespread uh, discrimination in housing and education, uh, in employment, which leads people, you know, out of their homes at young ages, both because of discrimination in the education system, also because of uh, rejection by families. So we see young people who are trans being homeless at really young ages. And then, you know, in this country, we criminalize homelessness. So what happens is people are homeless and they're trans and they're people of color. So they face policing in so many different ways and end up being driven into the criminal legal system where all of those cycles are, are re-triggered. Um, and then we have punitive systems that either keep people locked up or release people into uh, so-called alternatives to incarceration that themselves are discriminatory drug treatment programs, uh, anti-sex work programs that actually reject their trans individuals who are participating, which just then again leads people back into the criminal legal system. Um, and so unfortunately, we see incredibly high numbers of black trans women, for example, facing time in, in prisons and jails. Um, one study found that almost 50 percent of black trans women had been incarcerated at some point in their lives. You know, we have clients, we have people who call us all the time who are working jobs and they inform their employer that, you know, they're trans and they're going to be transitioning on the job and then just, you know, are summarily fired on that basis. But the reality is that as the advocacy community, we're not going to go down without a fight. The courts have been pretty consistent that trans people are protected. So we do have some have some tools uh, at our disposal. Talk about the measures that Obama took as president and if you think they went far enough. 
uh, implementing the Affordable Care Act that provided, you know, clear uh, interpretations of the non-discrimination provision saying health care for trans people has to be covered, um, that trans people can't be turned away from hospitals just because they're trans, even though that's a major problem um, that people have been experiencing for decades. It was really, a, you know, an important development under the Affordable Care Act. Um, and then a host of other regulatory provisions that brought trans people within the protection of the law. Um, all of that happened under, under Obama. Um, and in that was incredibly important um, for people's survival and protection. Of course, all of the measures that Obama took targeting immigrants, for example, in terms of this uh, degree of uh, deportations and enforcement of, of, of immigration law um, had a terrible impact on the trans community. So many undocumented trans people ended up in immigration detention where they were horribly abused. Uh, I certainly don't think that the Obama administration's Bureau of Prisons was acting mm -hmm. in a manner that uh, met constitutional standards. So I think it's important to honor all that he did do, but, but not sort of glorify the last eight years as if they were perfect when so many people in the community were struggling and targeted and dying. Genesis Gutierrez is an undocumented trans activist organizing for La Familia, trans queer liberation movement. She made national headlines for confronting President Obama over the cruel treatment of trans immigrants in ICE detention. Tell me about the hostile environment at these centers. There are um, a lot of human rights violations taking place inside immigrant detention facilities throughout the country. It's been well documented that the moment they are being held by ICE, right, the torture begins. Like, for instance, the misgendering, uh, the humiliation, the harassment. There's been cases of physical and sexual abuse that takes place inside these facilities by other people in detention and including some ICE officials. So already many of our sisters are escaping a lot of the violence, the rejection by loved ones, right? The family that doesn't really embrace or understand our uh, identity, the issues that we are dealing with. So it's, it's really heartbreaking to see how um, undocumented trans women have to be put in these cages to be subject to so much abuse. For the trans community, especially at times for their own safety, right, quote unquote safety, they um, put, put them in solitary confinement to protect, to protect them, right? But we know that also solitary confinement, it's also a, another type of torture that once you get put into this place, it's, it's really, it, it does have a toll on your mind and, and your, your uh, well-being. Are there any statistics about how many trans undocumented people there are living in this country? In reality, we have, um, it's estimated to be at least over 160,000 undocumented LGBTQ people, but we don't really have a specific number of undocumented trans women across the nation. Uh, however, we do know that at least since uh, Familia has been working on ending the trans attention campaign, we've been able to track down that at one point at the very beginning, right, when we started to put pressure here in Santa Ana, California, because the city jail has a specific section for LGBTQ people, that they call it the LGBT pod, where a lot of the people inside these cages are undocumented trans women. It was estimated that at least um, about 65 to 70 undocumented trans women were in, in a detention facility. Something that we need to think as a community, how do we make sure that we keep track of these individuals? How do we make sure that um, we are taking care of them, that they also don't feel left out, especially under this new current administration? Documented or not, abuse from state institutions is just one danger they face. 2016, the transgender community was hit heavily with trans murder, perhaps one of the highest we've had on record. Those are the ones that we know, right? This is not counting those who are, who go unreported or, or, or attempt suicides or suicides. Um, so in 2016, we had at least 26 uh, trans murder and the majority of them were uh, black trans women. Every year in the United States, dozens of trans people are murdered in hate crimes. Countless more are attacked. Can you talk about this hidden reality here? 
Yeah, I think one of the things that we often lose sight of because so much attention about trans people is focused on the ways in which we're targeted by legislation, focusing on restrooms or focusing on uh, sort of how scared other people are of us is the fact that trans people are actually the ones being targeted so often, uh, both by the government as well as by private individuals. And every year, the numbers of attacks on the trans community are rising. We're hearing about particularly trans women of color who are being murdered um, you know each year it's it's more and a lot of this has to do with just cycles of violence that leave trans people more precariously situated homeless targets for police profiling and all of these things contribute to the vulnerability to violence both at the hands of people who are known to the to the individual and strangers as well and how hard is it to actually attain these numbers because of the misgendering and and report inaccuracies yeah, that's absolutely one of the big problems is that oftentimes we don't know about the violence targeting the community, particularly when people are murdered because the family members misgender the individual, reporters misgender the individual. And so that's definitely something that we're working on. And, and we are getting better numbers because there's more information, there's more community accountability and visibility. But the reality is that these numbers are probably you know greatly uh, underestimated. This looming threat of physical violence is no doubt exacerbated by the ludicrous campaign pushing anti-trans legislation that centers on the fear of trans people and public restrooms. And I just wanted to say this as an offshoot, the bathroom thing, because so many conservatives literally do make this issue about bathrooms, Chase, and it's so insane because you just outline the horrendous state of trans rights uh, all across the board on basically every social issue, but somehow this is truncated into an insanely absurd thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the emphasis on, on bathrooms, I think, is just um, the, the, con, the sort of the Christian right and the anti-trans wing of the conservative movement has really tapped into an anxiety that we have as bathrooms, about bathrooms as a society, um, and they've <laughs> been able to be very successful. And so they uh, have used this fear of trans people, which is the thing that, of course, leads to all this discrimination, and they've capitalized on that fear by propagating myths about safety, about privacy, um, and have been able to really roll back civil rights protections in a host of contexts by exploiting the fear of trans people in bathrooms, which is, you know, which is in fact ridiculous, but people's sense of vulnerability in bathrooms is not ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, people do feel vulnerable in public bathrooms. They are disgusting. They are sometimes creepy. Um, and so we tap into that to then say the problem <laughs> and the solution is somehow expelling trans people from bathrooms, which will, of course, accomplish none of the stated aims in terms of increasing safety or, or increasing privacy. Um, but somehow that has become this rallying cry. And actually, the conservative in, you know, proponents of these anti-trans bills have gained a lot of support. All you have to do is run a campaign on myths and fear. And that's been the way that the movement against trans people has been incredibly successful. And I think now we're going to see that in a in a sort of broader scale, attacking a lot of communities. And say, you know, it's the same thing we saw with sort of the voter, the, the myth of voter mm -hmm. fraud, mm -hmm. you know, fueling these voter ID laws, the myth of trans people being dangerous, fueling these anti-trans laws. And all you have to do is sort of tell a story that it's scary to people, and then all of a sudden you have these repressive laws, and that's what we've seen at the state level, and I fear what we're going to see at the at the federal level, too. You know, it's fueled, obviously, this the Christian right. We have a Christian supremacist now in one of the most powerful positions in the world, um, Vice President Mike Pence. Uh, talk about the threats under this new administration, I mean, specifically just the evangelical wing. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, the, um, from Pence through, you know, the almost every single current nominee, uh, we're seeing some of the most extreme anti-LGBT individuals. Um, DeVos for Secretary of Education is incredibly concerning. Uh, she has a long history of supporting the most uh, extreme anti-LGBT groups, um, not to mention that she doesn't seem to know or care about education, um, which seems to be another <laughs> theme in the appointments. Um, and uh, and Pence himself has really been sort of a leader of the anti-LGBT crusade from his time in Indiana. So who knows what we're going to see in Congress. And then we have obviously states feeling um, energized to continue their assault on LGBT people and trans people in 
particular. Um, and, and we're seeing, too, a sort of emergence of what we saw in the anti-marriage context around religious beliefs about marriage and the, I, and the investment in protecting people's rights to discriminate against people based on those religious beliefs. We're seeing a, a new sort of a, a new doctrine emerge about religious beliefs about trans people and the idea that there's some moral or religious belief motivating a desire to discriminate against trans mm -hmm. people that is somehow a, a belief that one sex can only ever be um, the sex they were born or the sex they were assigned at birth and, and that has a theological basis. So they're now defending these um, anti-trans beliefs in, in a religious way. Uh, and, and it is... I think at its core, uh, what we see from these folks is that they just don't want LGBT people to exist. I mean, that is the solution for them. They believe in reparative therapy. They believe in, uh, yeah, in converting people um, and repressing people and, and arguing in the trans context that actually it's it's actually just a delusion. Um, so that's what we're seeing from from people who have just been given an incredibly high platform in the federal government. Um, so it is it is a scary time. It is indeed. And let's talk really quickly about the conversion therapy, because that seems like something like shock therapy. Like, yeah. how the hell is this still a thing and the fact that Mike Pence was actually trying to lobby for public funds to do so. Yeah, I mean, that's really what, this is what these people actually believe. I mean, they believe that uh, that gay people, that trans people pose a threat to society, that the answer is not to uh, provide people with the tools to be supported, but to actually find ways to make make L LGB people straight, to make trans people cis. I mean, this is their solution. Is And if you see now in the cases that we're litigating against these organizations and the governments that are passing anti-trans laws, they really are bringing in experts to say that uh, we need these laws because otherwise more people will be trans and being trans is a delusion. And if you feed the delusion, it will cause all like all of these terrible consequences and, and, and pointing to the suicidality and the discrimination as flowing from letting people be trans, not from having a society that is rejecting of trans people. So, so this is who we've now put into office, people who believe in uh, subjecting people to reparative therapy, people who believe that the solution is uh, to stop young people uh, from being able to live as their authentic selves. So I think we have a lot uh, to fight back against and a lot to be concerned about. What are the fronts that we need to be organizing around uh, best under the Trump administration? I mean, I think we just have to be really vigilant in all of our organizing and, and really sort of work together to make sure that we are providing relentless uh, people power, both at the state level and the federal level. Uh, we need to be telling stories um, because I think the laws you know, the laws only protect you so much, even at their best, and they um, can only be rolled back so much, even at their worst. But when you sort of entrench uh, and you do you entrench, you know, new cultural norms and you do base building and power building, you really have a, a strong movement that 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 can't be um, that that can't be totally trampled by the government. And I think that's where we have to put our energy and really stand up for each other. It's been like a roller coaster ride of emotions and with all these executive orders back to back in a very short time, like that is something that they are, they know what they're doing. They want to agitate people. They want to discourage people. It's really devastating. It angers me because again, now they have the whole system. They have Everything has been put in place, so now they're, you know, the new administration with, with 45, I don't even want to mention his name, right, because he's hurt so much our communities that um, now it's open, right? And he has made it very clear who the targets are, and that is communities of color. And that includes uh, immigrant people, that includes the transgender community, trying to push us back and, and, and you know, disappear um, or issues and struggles, and I'm glad that with all these uh, hard feelings and emotions that, I, that many people are going through, like it's people are really, uh, some people for the first time are getting interested in joining the resistance, and that is the direction that we need to go. Why is it so important to connect the struggles of trans and undocumented people? Uh, this is a moment where we, it's so important to listen to those communities that are more marginalized, but also connect with other communities. And the way to move forward is essential to 
uh, reach out to the black community, to the Muslim community, to the LGBT community, you know, all these other communities that have been um, attacked directly, openly. So this is the moment to really find ways to unite and come together and build a stronger resistance. And I do believe that. The viciously repressive atmosphere for LGBTQ people around the world is a relatively recent development in the long history of human society. As documented in contemporary anthropology, transgendered people are found to have not only existed, but been respected and revered. The birth of sexual and gender oppression coincides with the rise of class society, which brought the laws, state violence, and strict family codes to enforce the system of have and have nots. Capitalism continues to profit off these methods. From racism to poverty to police violence, trans people find themselves disproportionately affected but they've also been on the front lines of resistance. With a vibrant legacy in the U.S., their names are absent from our textbooks, despite having played critical roles in our history. Now in the age of Trump and a renewed attack on the LGBTQ community, trans voices need not only be heard by Americans, but also followed.